Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are so good. So good. No matter what goes on in our circumstances, you are worthy to be praised. That the miracles you have done all the way up to this point, Lord, we could never repay you for. But God, you're not done yet. There's so many more miracles. There is so much more goodness flowing from you because that is your nature. Lord, you are so good with your children. You care for us. You love on us. And so we want to praise you. We want to give thanksgiving. We want to extol you with gratitude. We want to make sure, Lord, that all of our heart, body, soul, and strength are loving you at a maximum. But Lord, these are days to worship you. These are days to talk about how great and marvelous you are. And so we will continue to praise you in the morning all the way through into the evening. God, be with us this weekend. Show us your face more clearly that we might worship you more rightly. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to welcome you once again to Bridgeway. I'm Pastor Lance here with Pastor Brian, and we know that things are a little bit different uh, this weekend, right? But we're all still together as a family, so we want to encourage you to be with us and interact with us, obviously, as we're doing online services. Uh, but I did have one quick announcement I wanted to get out to you real quick before I pass it over to my friend, and that is that we are basically going week to week. We never know what new information is going to come down. And the moment things are clear for us to join together as a family, we're going to do that. However, one thing that we are really looking forward to and shooting toward is to have a live Easter time together. There's going to be five services. We're going to have those up on that screen for you to be able to write those down. Now, I want to say that we don't know anything for sure, but we are sure Looking forward to that day. Absolutely. So as we continue in worship today, I want to once again encourage you, if you're watching on Facebook, please do engage in the comments section. Uh, say hello to the people that are watching with you. Share prayer requests. And as you see prayer requests, like those prayer requests so that people can know that you're praying for them. And we want to let you know that just we as a church, even though we can't gather physically on the weekends, church is still going on. So we're going to be engaging with you through email and social media. If you don't have the Bridgeway app yet, please please go get that from either uh, the App Store or the Google Play Store because we'll be getting information, devotionals, content, resources out to you uh, throughout all of this crazy time. So please make sure that you've got that and you're able to engage with us in that way. And thank you for being a part of our service this weekend. So we are going to move now to the part of our service where we worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. and just want to remind you of all of the different ways that you can give on Online. You can give at our website, bridgeway.church forward slash give. You can give through the app, uh, and then you can also give via text message. If you text Bridgeway CC, all one word, to 77977, you can be set up to give securely in about a minute. And however you give, we're really, really grateful for your partnership. Uh, as our faith family comes together week after week to give, God just does incredible things with that and is funding incredible ministry. And just a tangible difference that your giving is making, your giving allows us to do things like this, to have the resources and the technology, to have a church service where you can engage with us from all over the world, even at this time where we're not able to be together. So thank you so much for your giving. Thank you for worshiping with us this weekend. Let me pray, and uh, we'll continue in our time together. God, we thank you so much for the technology and the resources and the ability to worship together this weekend. In the midst of these uncertain times, we thank you that you are sovereign. So we pray, God, that we as your people would continue to be a light into our world during these times. We pray that as we give, you would take our gifts and use them to fund ministry that changes lives. Use it to fund ministry that in the midst of these dark times gives people hope and lets them know that you are there and that you are with us and that you love us. So we thank you for our faith family. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in ministry through giving. Use these gifts for your glory, God, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Well, now we have the opportunity to hear from God's word with Pastor Matt. So here he is. Thanks, guys. 
Well, it's an honor to get a chance to talk through God's word with everyone here this weekend. And, uh, you know, I think God has actually picked a passage in Ephesians in our series that's especially what we need to hear at this point in time. And so, uh, so we're in part 10 of our uh, Connecting with God series. And uh, we're really going to be talking today, this weekend, about knowing God. And, and we're going to see that connection means knowing God. That's going to be the fill in the blank that you'll find digitally. And there's a big difference between knowing about God versus wanting to know God versus knowing God. And so if I can kind of illustrate this, um, I I took on this really um, stupid venture of deciding to do a PhD where I'm studying King Samuel in the book of, or King Saul in the book of Samuel. And as I've been studying him, I'm learning more and more about King Saul. I'm learning about his family lineage, and I'm learning about the terms used to characterize him and the ways that he acts. And there's even passages that go inside of his head and what other scholars think about him and what other people in the scriptures think about him and how he's mentioned. And I know a lot right now, and I still have four more years to know. (laughs) I know a lot about King Saul, but I don't know King Saul. But if I were to talk to you about my wife, Becky, I can tell you that I know my wife. I know the things that make her laugh. I know the things that make her cry. I know the stories of her childhood. I even know some of her pets she had when she was young. I know how how goofy she gets at night. I know the things that she'll eat and the things that she hates that I do especially. (laughs) And so what you're gonna find is that there's a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And so knowing God, to talk about this right now, this weekend, it's timely for where we're at in our world. Because knowing God can drastically affect how we work through life. It drastically affects how we navigate and how we live, and it changes everything. Knowing God is something so special, and it's something we can desire more and more. And if you got a chance to go back to the Old Testament, you can go to Exodus chapter 33. And in chapter 33, verses 12 to 13, Moses is going to talk about wanting to know God and know him deeply. And what's going to happen is, even though he already encountered God at the burning bush, even though God has already revealed his power and his miracles with the 10 plagues in Egypt, even though he delivered them across the Red Sea, provided for them in the desert, brought them to Mount Sinai, and gave them his truth and his covenant and his presence, a whole bunch of bad stuff's still going to happen, and the people are going to worship idols. And God's almost not going to go with Israel. And in verses 12 and 13... Moses is going to go back and talk to God, and he's going to say, you know me by name, and I know that you show favor with me, and I have favor in your sight. And he's going to start by talking about how he has this personal relationship with God. Just the chapter before, it's going to say that he is the one who sees God face to face. And he says, you know me by name, and you show favor with me. But even after all this, he's going to ask God, he's going to say, show me your ways that I may know you that I may continue to find favor in your sight. And if you were to go on to verse 17, God's gonna echo that back to him. I do know you by name. I do find favor on you. But you're gonna find that he's gonna wanna know God more even after how much he already knows God. And he's gonna eventually tell God, please show me your glory. And so knowing God, it brings this rich quality to our lives. The Apostle John gives us a little sneak peek into the prayers of Jesus in John chapter 17, and he's going to reveal that it's about knowing the Lord Jesus, and it's about relationship with the Lord Jesus that matters. And so in John chapter 17, verses 2 and 3, he's going to say, now this is eternal life, when you know the Lord, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I mean, have you ever thought about that? That eternal life is not merely about an endless existence that starts after you die. Eternal life starts, the quality of life starts when you know the Lord Jesus. It starts when you get deeper and you get closer to him, when you encounter him. And that's something that continues eternally, that you start a relationship that will go on forever. And see, it's a blessing and it's an inspiration to know certain people. I'm looking at so many people in this room right now that I'm blessed by and I'm inspired by. And yet, knowing Jesus is gonna be the thing that blesses and fulfills life the most. It's the greatest thing that we can enjoy. And yet, there's so many competitors to that. 
If I were to take you to another passage in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 to 25, it says this, don't let the wise man brag of their wisdom. So your schooling and all your knowledge, it means little. Don't let the heroes brag of their exploits. Don't let the strong men boast of his strength. Don't let the rich brag of their riches. Because the job and the hours and the money and the stuff that you have, it doesn't matter. He says, if you brag, brag about this and this alone. That you understand and know me. That I am God and I act in loyal love. I do what's right and I set things right and fair and I delight in those who do the same thing. Things, these are my trademarks. That God says the best thing that you can boast about is knowing him. And so you have this contrast, these three features of our identity that fade and the features of God. Trademarks that you come to know as you spend more time with him, as you draw closer to him as you continue to listen for his voice and as you encounter him. And God wants us to learn these wonderful features, to see why they are things that will make your life full, that will make your life matter. They are hope in times when life seems purposeless or chaotic. It's hope in a time like this, that we can be a people that have a reputation for knowing God a people who think and learn and live. And that's not just about the beginning of our faith. That's our entire faith as it continues to progress. But like we had mentioned, we're in part 10 of our Ephesians series. So let's see what Ephesians has to say about this. Verses one, chapter one, verses 15 and 17. This is what it says. I would tell you what Bible page to turn to, but I don't know what Bible you're using. For this reason... Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We're gonna stop right there, but you're gonna find that we're jumping in into a sentence that's gonna go all the way to verse 23. 150 words, a long sentence. But overall, you're gonna learn a very familiar lesson from Paul where he's gonna help us see that connection means knowing God. And it also means a commitment to other believers. That as you draw closer with God, as you get to know him more, then you end up connecting better with other people and you start praying for others to spiritually thrive. You want to watch people's relationship with God deepen. And it's kind of this idea that often we tend to think about our faith and our knowledge and our thriving as just what's happening for me. But if you imagine trying to play on a team or to be part of a group where only one person was getting better and better and more and more skilled and was going deeper and understanding how to function and thrive The team as a whole doesn't move forward. Only that one person does. And so you have a commitment and a connection with all of the body of Christ that you wanna see everybody thrive. Not just a pastor, not just a ministry leader, not just yourself. You wanna see every person thrive. And so Paul speaks into this and he starts by commending the church. And you have to remember, we're talking about the book of Ephesians. At this point where Paul's writing from, he hasn't even seen the Ephesians for about five to six years. So some of the things he's talking about, he doesn't even know the people he's talking about anymore because there's new believers. There's new people that have come to know God and he's hearing the stories of strangers as well as people that he knew. And so he starts by kind of pointing backward and he says, for this reason, and he's looking back over everything he said up to this point. And he says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. He starts by talking about faith. What type of faith? This is called pistis in the Greek. It's faith that's lived out, that dwells in us, but it's faith that's observed by people. And it's more than a feeling of trust or belief in in truth of some sort. It's something that's active. A lot of us tend to forget that faith is, is a moral thing as much as it is a heart and a mind thing because it's actually the first fruit of the spirit in the book of Galatians. It's something we're supposed to live by. And it's not just what one thinks, it's the way that one thinks. But when Paul's talking about faith, he's always relating it to Jesus Christ, that you have faith in Christ. It's the object of your faith that matters. We wanna believe 
in who Jesus is. We want to believe in what he's done. And it's not just a belief, but it's a confidence in those things. It's a reliance on those things. It's a commitment. One scholar says it this way. He says, trusting in God is rooted in the belief that what is said about God is true and real trust manifests manifests itself in the way one lives life in action. And that's deep, that's good, that's profound. But let's take it down a level, let's simplify it. I love it, there's a little parable that simplifies this well. It says, once there was a group of villagers that decided to pray for rain. And on the day of the prayer, all the people gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. That's faith. That's a faith that relies and has confidence in who you're praying to, in who your God is, in who you know. And Paul talks all throughout his letters that we are justified by this faith. It's an obedience. It's a surrender rather than an attitude of what we're doing. And so that the more you know God, the more Jesus continues to work and the more that God's grace changes us from the inside out. And so faith moves us into union with Jesus through a Christ-like trust and we grow in that faith. And Paul celebrates them the most for this. But he, we have to look at what he's excited about because he's hearing about their faith. He says, your faith. In Romans 1, he's gonna say that he speaks of the faith that that church has among one another. And what you have to understand is that Paul's writing to these people and he's going, I'm excited about what's happening with you specifically. So then I look at that and I go, what are some of our stories here at Bridgeway? What are some of the things that God has been doing in faith? And I want to share with you just a few people that I've observed. And I could be here all night or all weekend talking about this. But one is a guy that's been going to Bridgeway for a few years now. His name is Richard Hurst. Richard came to one of our prayer times here when Pastor Lance was teaching through it in the supernatural. And he had major back pain. And he had God, he had been asking people to pray for him. Richard, from that point, his back wasn't healed, but he continued to go into every class and he continued to go and spend time talking with anybody and getting involved in any missional community because he wanted to know God more. And he was always thrilled at everything he learned and everything he experienced. And he continued to have fresh revelation and to have fresh growth in his faith. And it's been such an honor to watch him thrive. But even in the last couple months, he's been going even deeper and knowing God even more. And his prayer life has dynamically even grown and he's watching God starting to heal his back. And you can see it in his body language and you can see it in his smile. Or if I were to share about another one, there's a, there's a gentleman um, that helps out with our men's ministry named Patrick. And he started doing a group at his house because he has this thirst to see transformation happening in his community. He wants everyone to come and experience the same God that he knows and that he sees changing his life and his family. And he wants his neighborhood to see that. So he's cooking out on his driveway and he's inviting people to come over and just join them in his garage to know more and more about Jesus. And I've known Patrick for so many years and I've watched his faith thrive and grow. Or there's a family here and one of them that works in our creative arts department that they've watched God's faithfulness and providing them a place to live. That due to different work things happening and not being able to lock in and being, lock into homes and being evicted from places that they were renting. This lady and her family, they went through these times where they were moving around and she had to pull all of her clothes out of a 60 gallon bucket all the time. And then God brought them into a home because of the faithfulness of people blessing them and she held on to what God was doing in faith. That when she finally moved into her house and had been in there a little about 60 days, one day she goes to take her clothes out of the closet and it starts making her cry because she realized she didn't have to take it out of a bucket anymore. And there she was realizing what her faith in God had been doing as she's watched God work. Or I have another friend named Emmanuel that last year he had an opportunity to, uh, he, had a, he had a cousin that ended up in the hospital and he knew that cousin didn't know the Lord. And because of that, he decided making a decision last minute to go fly to Spain to just go spend time with his family and pray for them that she would come to know the Lord. Now that's one of those things that you only do because of the faith 
and knowledge you have in Jesus Christ. And these are, none of these people are things that they would boast about themselves. They are people that they would go, I know who my God is and I know what he wants me to do. And even this last weekend, we had people on this stage at a memorial service for a guy in our church named Josh Pock. And Josh just passed away from brain cancer just a few weeks ago. And what the people talked about with Josh and with what so many of us experienced was a guy that lived with a deep knowledge and a nearness to God. And people kept talking about the faith. They were, they'd heard, they had watched, they had seen his faith. This is all to say that here and now, as much as Paul was saying it then, we are hearing and seeing people's faith in the Lord Jesus. And that's a blessing. But also, he says, we're hearing of your love to all the saints. Now, saints was the primary term that Paul used for the people of God. And he's saying, I'm looking around and I'm seeing all these resurrected people, companions on the journey of faith, people that are in relationship with God. These are not elite, outstanding people. See, everyone thinks of saints from the Catholic Church of what they started canonizing in the 10th century. And they don't realize that the saints were all people made holy by God's intent and action. And Paul says, I'm hearing of your love to all those people. And he uses that word, a very popular word we talk about in church, agape. It means to seek the good and welfare of the other, to give rather than possess. And it's this mentality, it's this attitude of focused love. And it's directed not just at the lovable, but at all the saints. It's to have affection, it's to have concern for others. And yes, it's supposed to start with the saints, but then it spills out. Paul will say in the book of Galatians that we're supposed to do good to all people, but especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And then again, when I look at this, I go, what are some of our stories of how we are seeing people loving the saints? Well, there was a family here in the church that just recently, their house caught on fire. That would kind of freak you out a little bit, I think, right? Your house catches on fire and you lose almost everything in your house. And right off the bat, right when that happened, the community of faith starts coming around them. And one of the first things you see that goes a long way, more than I think we realize, is there's another family that says, hey, your family can come and live with us until you get this figured out. And it's not that they have crazy amounts of space. They just know that they want to love. They want to seek the good and welfare of this family. And then you have people going, well, what can we do? Well, we're going to bring groceries, but we're not going to just bring it for the family that lost everything. We're going to bring it for the family that's hosting them. And we're going to keep providing anything we have to seek after your good and welfare. There's so many people in the church that they end up seeking out the good and welfare of others. They serve. And with generous hearts, they find ways to bless people. One great story that I've seen in the last couple months is that there was a young lady in our missional community that God had put her in a spot where she needed to get rid of her car. She had a good car, but she didn't want to sell it. She felt like God was try trying to direct her to find a way to bless someone with it. And I happened to know a young adult that was in one of my classes at Jessup that also goes here. And so I gave them each other's numbers and they set it all up for her to give this car. And then when she goes and meets this guy, he has another friend with him. And she's like, what's going on? And he's like, I do need a car, but he needs it more. And so he goes and passes this car from Lauren on to this friend that has nothing because he at least had a car, it just didn't run the best. And you see that and you see people with a heart of loving generously. And it's Jesus himself that says in John 13, 34 and 35, they're gonna know that you're my disciples, that you're my followers if you love one another. John would add to this. In the book of 1 John, it's another one of the letters, John reminds us of the gravity and he'll say, we love because God first loved us, agapo, agapo. If anyone says he loves God and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so John talks about these aspects of loving selflessly, 
Loving sacrificially. Loving understandingly. Not thinking, what is this going to do for me? Not thinking, what do I gain? It's to love without limits, knowing that there's going to be a cost to yourself, but you're okay with that because you know a God who has everything. But it also means to love in this understanding way where you know people. You live life with open ears and open eyes. There's a famous African-American uh, writer and preacher named W.E. Dubois, and he says this powerful statement. It's always stuck with me. He says, herein lies the tragedy of the age. Not that men and women are poor. Not that men and women are wicked. But that men and women know so little about other men and women. Because the more we know each other, and we know what each other are going through, then then we're able to seek the good and welfare of others. And, and unfortunately, I believe that there's a mentality today that we think our faith in God or our relationship with God is shown in our attendance at programs or our individual spirituality. And the way that we treat others is not always high up on the list. But a lack of compassion is a symptom of a deeper lack. It shows that there's something missing that we don't know someone or something as much as we should. And when John says that we hate our brothers, the, the word in Greek there is this idea of an aversion from the good and welfare of another. Whereas love is seeking the good and welfare, hate is not a feeling, it's not an emotional anger, it's a, I'm gonna ignore the needs. I don't care what's going on for you. It's avoidance. It's, it's an ignorance of people. This is what teens especially are professionals in this. They know how to walk by someone and totally avert themselves to someone's need. But this command to love one another that Paul is talking about in Ephesians, that he's seen among the saints, this is something that they talked about in the Old Testament and I can go off talking about what Deuteronomy says about it. What Jesus says when people ask him, what are the greatest commandments? But Paul knew that the presence of loving relationships provided the best environment for a fuller understanding and for people's faith to thrive. And when we're watching every believer thrive, we start sharing life. We start becoming one in Christ. And that all happens by the activity of the Spirit. So that leads into verse 16 where he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And so he's still commending them for their continual action, and so that makes him continually want to give thanks, which automatically tells us that we want to be just like Paul and be continually praying for others and continually giving thanks for what we're seeing God do, not just in my life and circumstances, but in everyone's life and circumstances. And he moves from the first 14 verses where he spent all this time thanking God for what God's done, and now he moves to blessing his friends. He wants to thank God for them. He wants to remember them, both for the past, what has happened, what has been done, and I think he's also thankful for the future, what they're still going to keep growing in, and what's going to change in their world. And so we're supposed to be filled with thanksgiving, and we're supposed to be filled with thanksgiving simply from our relationship with God not just from how good our circumstances are in, not because we have things in control. We're thankful and we express thanksgiving and we bless God because God works in all situations. And so we're reminded to pray for others, to intercede personally for people, to turn from ourselves and worship God for what he's doing in others. But that leads us to the last verse, verse 17 where he goes into his proper request. And you can almost put an I ask right in front of this because he's saying, I'm asking that the God, our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And he starts by talking about this God that Paul knows because he understands God and his activity. He understands the nature of Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. And he acknowledges, this is the God that hears our prayers. This is the God that reveals himself. I know that God. And this is one of Paul's most personal and precious, pr precious prayers. That's a hard word to say, precious prayers. But it involves all the persons of the Trinity. 
all three. And he starts by saying this is the God of. And we can focus on the word God, but this is one of those times that the word of matters here because it's showing the relationship between God and the Lord Jesus. That he's looking at the God of the Lord Jesus. He's focusing his eyes and his ears on that special relationship. And then when he says it's our Lord, he's saying this is a personal Lord that you can know. He's the one Lord that you can experience. And his name is Jesus. Our Lord Jesus, the personal name and the title of Christ. Because he's going to say, Jesus the Messiah, the one who comes and saves us. And then he says, our glorious Father. And I want to stop there just for a sec, because that term is really powerful. Because although sometimes we tend to know what glory is, or Father is, we don't tend to always understand what glory is really represents, because here it's the essence of God's being. This is the attributes of God that make up how you know him. It's his reputation. It's the ways that you've seen God work in your family and in your relationships and in the chaos going on in the world. It's the ways that you've seen God work in your past and the ways that you see God work in the present. It's the stories you've heard outside of you, and it's the things that you've read It's all of those pieces put together and it's God showing us his splendor and his power in all that he's doing. He's the source. He's the glorious father that emanates his reputation and the things you know and he does it constantly. But then what he wants is that glory shoots out and then it hits us and it's supposed to bounce back and then it glorifies him. So it brings it full circle to worship him in praise, and that pleases him when we recognize these things. But now Paul's gonna specify these gifts that he's praying to God to give us. He's actually gonna talk about five things, and and next weekend, Pastor Paul's actually gonna walk through the other three. We're just gonna talk about two to finish up our time here. Because he's gonna first start by saying, may he give you the spirit of wisdom. And when he talks about the spirit of wisdom, these are the qualities of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people argue on whether it's a spirit of, like from us, or it's the Holy Spirit. But human spirits cannot give revelation. Only God's spirit can. And that's why we know it's from the Holy Spirit. And they're qualities of the spirit who Paul has already talked about in the beginning that we have received and we've been sealed by. This is not a second or a new work for someone to become more elite, that now I get a special moment here of more wisdom and more revelation. This is what all believers get by what he's already brought in the spirit, and it can't be generated by humans, which is why Paul's praying for it. May you have it by the spirit. And it's for the whole church, to everybody who's received the Holy Spirit, all the things Paul's talked about in the first 14 verses. But we want to talk about what is that spirit of wisdom. It's it's insight. It's insight into the true true nature of things. Paul referred to wisdom more than any other writer in the New Testament. He kept coming back to this term. It's Sophia in Greek. To know the true nature of God. To have insight into the true nature of who he is at a formational level that affects how you live. And that was a theme of wisdom literature that God doesn't provide us with systems. God doesn't provide us with formulas to navigate life with wisdom. He provides us with himself. And that's why the greatest statement you see in the Old Testament to talk about wisdom is that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because it's God, it's knowing the nature of God that helps you to navigate everything that you go through. And that's developed through close experience. It's it's known as an attribute of God, but it's developed when you truly encounter and know the one who demonstrates wisdom, who is wisdom. And Paul, he'll keep using those terms through all of his letters. He'll talk about our minds, our thoughts, our wisdom, our knowledge. They're constant in Paul's theme. He frequently references it. He has so many contexts in which he uses it. He gives it a fundamental place. But he's saying, I'm praying that you will have this spirit of wisdom. But he doesn't stop there. He talks about another one. He says, may he give you the spirit of revelation. And the spirit of revelation is this, that things are unveiled, that things are disclosed. 
It's that idea of pulling back a curtain and going, oh, look. And he's saying, it's by these things that are hidden in God and unknown to humans that the spirit pulls back the curtain and he shows you the reality. He shows you the truth. He shows you the facts. And you get access to a deeper knowledge. And so we want to focus on the broadest and the most complex and the most wonderful subject that can be known by wisdom and revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's done both in the past and what he is still doing right now. John Piper says it this way. He says, zero in on Jesus with your heart tuned to see his immense love. Focus in. But if I can give you one more picture as we're finishing here. Very, very famous movie that brings you so many theological truths, the movie Hook. (laughs) But there's that really special part where Peter Panning is finally with all the lost boys and they're not sure what to do with him. And there's a little character, a little short African-American kid named Pockets. And Peter Panning is down on his knees and the kid comes over and he takes off Peter Panning's glasses and he starts touching his face. And it's a very awkward scene at first. And then suddenly he pulls back Robin Williams' face. And then he says this. Oh, there you are, Peter. And I love that story because when we're talking about being given wisdom and revelation, it tells us that it's in the knowledge of him. It's us finally looking and going, oh, there you are, Jesus. And realizing that you can recognize God in his revelation. You can not just know about God, you can know God. And that's huge. I like what uh, John uh, J.I. Packer says. He says, Christians have been improperly influenced by modern ideas about God, which view him as distant, small, and completely unknowable. But I like what another more popular theologian also says, which he has a great name. His name is Snodgrass, which just that itself is awesome. But he talks about how when we're knowing God, we're knowing him experientially. And I like what he says, because he says, no one can know God fully, but we can all know God really. And that's part of our challenge for you as we go into another week and we look ahead is to realize that you have the ability to know the God of the universe. You have the ability to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You're able to see what he's doing in the lives of people around you and you're able to see the love that people are showing among the saints but then what they're showing among the world. And now is an opportunity more than any other to go and live that as you come to know the God of the angel armies, our God and Father, glorious Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to see all those things come true. So let our search and our purpose be on the only thing, the only person that is constant, the only one that has power, that is more committed than any person that we're ever gonna meet, more dependable than any job that we're ever gonna have, has more worth than anything we're ever gonna own, and is more valuable than any grade we're ever gonna get. Let's focus on knowing God. Let that spur us on to living in faith and in love. And so let me pray for you as a body. And then we'll continue into the week, praying for you, finding ways to minister and love on you as the body of Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything that you're doing. We thank you that you're a God that is in control and we thank you that you're a God that we can know deeper and deeper. Thank you for that access. Thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and we pray God that you would pour on even more into us, over us, through us, Lord. May we learn as we talk more to people about what we know about you and that, may that remind us of the truths and the realities that you have disclosed and you have revealed to us. God, may that fill our cups to the brim that, Lord, we see with new eyes and new minds and new hearts and we hear with new ears and we act with new hands so that the people in this area and the people in this world see 
us as a community that has a reputation of knowing God. And God, may that drive our hope. May that dismiss all our fears. And may you be glorified, Lord. May the glory that you emanate out bounce off of us and come back to you in praise. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for church this weekend. We're so glad that you were able to be with us. Don't forget, we're going, to be ha- we're going to be having information pushed out to you this week on social media, so follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Grab that app if you don't have it yet, the Bridgeway Christian app from either the App Store or Google Play. And then we have got group discussion questions and some individual reflection questions for you, and you can find those at bridgeway.church forward slash CWG. That stands for Connecting with God. God. So bridgeway.church forward slash CWG. We love you. Thank you for being with us and we look forward to seeing you soon.